The central banks are pumping the markets up with $100 billion worth of freshly created fiat currency every single month. Governments and central banks have been easing back on restrictions, loans are easy to come by, lending standards are reduced. Hey, why not? We don't have to worry about another subprime crisis because everything is fine now, right? The Fed loves us because they're printing money to help us. I mean, we want them to buy stocks if necessary, don't we? You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. If people only understood how the Federal Reserve was set up, in the darkness of night, they created this central bank. It wasn't always there. The Federal Reserve was a continuation of different central banks that were in the United States previously, in these previous years. None of them ever worked out until they went to this depth, to this level, to create the most insidious plan in order to get this moved through Congress, make it happen when nobody was paying attention. And the general public is too busy with their bread and circus to be able to worry about something they clearly still today, a hundred plus years later, have no idea, no explanation as to what this organization does. You even saw Jerome Powell in front of everybody say we are not part of the government. People don't care. If they're going to buy something, stocks and that means that stocks are going to stay up high they will actually go for it they will yell and they will cheer and they will rejoice in what they're doing but this insanity cannot go on forever now you know what i'm going to do a rant video in, in addition to this one, I'm going to stop right there. Let me get into the video because I wanted to start talking about the repos. This happens every single day. I show you this kind of data and you're looking at $76.9 billion. They told us that's it. It wasn't going to be a problem anymore. Here we are in 2020. There's obviously still demand there. Now, while that's may, this may go down, it may go up, who knows? But clearly the demand for the Federal Reserve to be there hasn't let up. We know that. All right. Now, taking a look at Morgan Stanley. They said that the Fed liquidity is staunching the S&P 500 bleeding. I think that goes without saying, to me anyway, but for the majority of individuals, they're unaware of what the repo crisis is all about. They just know that the Federal Reserve is taking care of it. Okay, I'm good. I'm out of here. You do what you got to do. The flare-up is unlikely to knock down the S&P 500 by more than 5% because the Federal Reserve and other major central banks are injecting money into the financial system. The Fed, the Bank of Japan, and the ECB are expanding their balance sheets by a total of $100 billion a month while their counterpart in China last week just trimmed the amount of cash that lenders must hold in reserve. Everybody is making it easier. You look on a global level. Sure, you do have some variances, of course, but generally, Generally, things are getting easier. Money is becoming very liquid at this point in order to flood the system with much needed capital because of the actual economic contraction that has taken place. There is, are two very different things, very opposing factors here. You have the real economy and then you have the markets. And that is apparent more now than ever before. Take a look at this. This is an article of Reuters and it's talking about the repo situation. The question now is what it will take for the U.S. Central Bank to withdraw from its daily liquidity operations in the $2.2 trillion market for repurchase agreements or repos after it became a dominant player in a short three months. You know what this is all about. I've been covering it here very frequently and I can't believe it, but I agree with two of the major banks. Let's look at their quotes. The repo operations are a band-aid, but the wound isn't fully healed. This is coming out of TD Securities and I completely agree with that. If you're trying to fix the problem simply by pumping more money in, you're never going to come to a conclusion. You're never going to resolve it. It's just like QE1, 2, and 3, and now 4. There has been absolutely no resolution. I may actually be a bull at some point if I would see resolution. If I would see some of these banking establishments go completely bankrupt, you would have revaluations of all these companies they would start to get smart at the rating agencies and if we saw a lot of these people who were behind all of these activities actually be reprimanded for their actions then i would start to say okay now we're onto something this is fantastic this is good news let's rebuild from the ashes but that didn't happen and here we are today we are trying to create a system in which there's basically a 
toxic waste dump and you're putting your luxury mansion on top of it. Is that a good thing to do? Well, look, walk around inside. Seems fantastic to me, but the toxic waste is underneath. Don't worry, just plug your nose. The Fed began injecting billions of dollars in liquidity into the repo market in mid-September when a confluence of events sent the cost of overnight loans as high as 10%, more than four times the Fed's rate at the time. They lost control and there was no way to get it back and they didn't know what to do. Thankfully, the market corrected itself at this point. It's a huge market, okay? This is considered to be the most liquid market around the world, along with their injections and, of course, with the dominant players, whether that's JP Morgan, whoever will find out two years from now, they have been able to turn it around temporarily, but that's only because they remain in the market. Further along in the article, the Fed will continue pumping tens of billions of dollars a day into the repo market through at least the end of January. The ability to exit from the repo market after that time will depend on how long it takes the central bank to make the balance sheet large enough so that there are adequate reserves in the banking systems. This is what they keep saying. This is what they've been talking about since they started this. But what's interesting is that if you look back into it and if you actually analyze what happened, I've I've shown you this before, but basically their balance sheet, if we look at it on the chart, you know, we saw this come coming down, coming down, coming down. And then they brought in their repo operations and they brought in this whole QE4, whatever you want to call it. And clearly you see that. But if you look at the dates very carefully, the point at which it starts to go up was actually in early September, not when they admitted that they started their repo operations. It was before that. And as far as I'm concerned, they knew exactly what was going on. They didn't announce it until after the fact. They didn't go ahead into the public and admit it, but you can see it very clearly right there. And who knows what they were doing behind the scenes. Right here, we have Bank of America saying this, which again, I agree with. It seems implausible to me that the Fed will be able to stop their repo operations by the end of January. They're going to have to keep going. They're going to have to push forward. And despite all that which we have seen in the markets, they've been performing fantastically, obviously. They've basically been going up in a straight line. And why? because it's got QE4 written all over it. Does anybody disagree with that at this point? I mean, it's it's child's play when you look at it. This is very clear to see their level of integration in there. How are they ever going to pull out? This here is from Forbes. Participants agreed that their review of monetary policy strategy tool and communication practices would continue at future meetings and as a result that the committee would not reaffirm its existing statement or longer run goals and monetary policy strategy in the January 2020 meeting that was in the Fed minutes. Now what we're talking about here basically is that they are going to persist with their current actions. They're not going to change anything and for the foreseeable future we're going to get more of the same. So they're going to continue with the repos. They're going to continue with the QE4. And then at some point later, maybe they're going to change that. They say, apparently, they say that mid 2020, I've heard numbers coming out from April 2020, they're going to start to reduce that. We'll see what they do. Now, speaking of central banks, Ben Bernanke says that the Fed shouldn't rule out using negative interest rates. If you saw the other video I had done about this, I included this one in a video, but I just wanted to bring it up again, just because it is relevant essentially these central bankers are all going towards the same direction extremely low interest rates and if necessary which of course next time they will be they will need to use negative rates we saw janet yellen many years ago say something to the effect of if it were positive to take interest rates into the negative i would be voting for that this is the way it goes because ultimately they want this to happen they want interest rates to go into the negative and create an up upheaval. That's a whole different topic for another day. Now we have what's happening with oil. Just wanted to mention it very quickly because it's going on right now. I did a post on my community or blog section of the channel essentially saying, don't worry, everybody, everything's going to be fine because all of a sudden the markets went back up because those tensions, that reason that they came down just a tiny little bit, well, that's all over now. Nothing to worry about. I mean, when I was reading these articles, I was laughing out loud how ridiculous it is because it's all about pushing the markets up higher no matter what happens, no matter what 
what happens? Volatility barely moves at all. I mean, it's near historic lows still. And today we have all these potential conflicts and disruptions. It doesn't even matter. Oil erased most of the earlier gains as investors took stock of the fact that there hasn't been a supply disruption after the tensions with the US and so on. We know about that, but it's funny to see the way that the market reacts to this. The oil did come up uh, quite a bit and for the Brent crude, it went just above $70 a barrel and it's come down ever since. I think at the recording was approximately $68 a barrel, but regardless. This is what we get into as well, talking about gold. And well, I was very surprised about this to see that there are actual investors in the paper side anyway that are buying into gold here. And they've been doing so for a little while. It's been silently creeping up higher and higher and higher. It was trading in a range for years. We saw it just going nowhere, even though all other assets, you look at basically any other assets in the everything bubble, they were going higher and higher and higher. Precious metals basically stayed put. They didn't move, they traded within a range and we saw that, but now, we have Jim, Jim, Jim Kramer saying endless buying for gold could signal a shift to the real fear in the stock market. This is basically what he's saying is if all of the buying is taking place in gold, something is definitely going on. There are rumblings underneath and people should be concerned about that. If you look at what Jim Kramer said about a year ago saying, oh my goodness, everyone's got to buy gold now because I'm really afraid and things are falling apart. And you know what he said, I covered that before, but basically that this is like the big signal for him what happens with gold i thought it's interesting not that i would take his advice or anything but just looking at somebody like that because he's talking to the ceos he's talking to people in the business and he obviously has his finger on the pulse at least at the surface level what we're what we're seeing in the financial industry now speaking of which when you look at all of these different analysts and their predictions i covered that in the previous video but i, I found a new chart and it's just interesting to see all of these different companies they always put out these numbers and as far as I'm concerned, they are completely worthless. But I think it's just funny to see them. Somebody over here might say 3,400. Another person might say 3,300. But the question is, if the stock market is going to go up pretty much every single day from here to the end of the year, why wouldn't it be at 4,000? Why wouldn't it be at 5,000? Who knows, right? I mean, if that's what these people believe, that the quantitative easing is going to be there, that the low interest rates or even potential rate cuts are coming, why wouldn't we see even higher? numbers. This is kind of ridiculous to just try and put a number on it to actually predict the future. But if you take a look at the comment section, there's uh, usually a small handful of people that know exactly what's going to happen. So uh, maybe they can give advice. I, I don't know. It's kind of ridiculous. Wall Street market analysts see a deeper sell-off ahead ripe for a tactical correction. But again, the point is made here. They are saying, you know, there might be a five to seven percent dip down or, or six to seven percent as it says here. But don't worry about it because things will climb up afterwards. My question is, why would they ever come down? They're printing money while well, the Federal Reserve is there to step in in case something bad happens. Why would it even come down at all? That's the question I'd like to know. And then we have real economic factors here that you could see Pier 1 imports to close up to 450 stores amid bankruptcy fears. You don't have to worry about this ever because this is all part of something really small and it's not a big issue. It's not part of a larger issue as we have covered so many times before. But just wanted to track the progress on that. 450 stores there. We got Borden becoming the second big US milk producer to file for bankruptcy. And this is in two months. So this is an industry that's heavily subsidized. We know that same thing goes on in Canada as well, and I'm sure across the world, and still these companies can't make ends meet. There are different reasons for this, of course, but I'm just showing you right now how an industry entirely can be disrupted, can be supplanted or replaced. Nothing is safe, that's for sure. And then we have dailyjobcuts.com where I love to check out on occasion, at least once a week anyway. And you could see here some of the examples, Macy's closing 11 stores. You're seeing Lint laying off 300 people. The Pier 1 Imports also is part of this too. This is just a website that I check out to keep up to date with this. And I wanna bring you all of my sources, all of my stats when I can. Everything is always sourced in the description. I put every single thing down there. So if you look under the sources on any of the videos, you're gonna get that. 
That's all for this video. If you found it informative, hit that thumbs up button. This channel is absolutely screeching to a halt. There's almost no growth whatsoever at this point. The views are down, income's down, everything's just down. What I hope is that for my subscribers, all I'm asking is just to click one button before you leave at some point. That's it. Just click one button. Really does support me. Thank you very much. If you want to learn how to build a business to make some passive income on the side, then this is for you because it's a free e-course. You don't have to pay anything. There are courses out there that charge anywhere between $1,000 and $5,000. They're teaching you how to sell on Amazon. And I've created a free e-course basically condensing down what I have learned over the years and wanted to bring that to you, my subscribers. Check it out at the Amazon GPS.com. If you want to learn about the financial system, if you want to understand how it's built up from top to bottom, these two books have everything you need. Check them both out at the link in the description if you want the audiobook, themoneygps.com. I got into so much in this video here, so you definitely want to check it out. It breaks down a lot of what we were getting into here on more in depth. So check it out. I'll see you there.